this time on Psychic Investigators. When a college student vanishes, everyone's looking. None of her friends had any information, had no idea where Kim Antonakis was. Then, a psychic sees a twisted plot. I knew there were men. I knew they were waiting for her. They could feel the ropes. And says she's in grave danger. They say she played in the sandbox that she didn't belong in. Can the psychic help to solve the mystery of what happened to Kim Antonakis? I knew she was alive, and I knew they had to find her right away. Brooklyn, New York. In 1995, the borough suffers more than its fair share of the city's long tradition of crime and violence. A place where sometimes innocent people get hurt. It's nearly 4 a.m. on March 1st. After a night out in Manhattan, 20-year-old college student Kim Antonakis drops her friend, Liz Pace, at her apartment in Canarsie. then drives a few blocks to her own apartment. Later that day, Kim's dad gets a call. Kim is a no-show at her part-time job. It's totally out of character. Tommy Antonakis immediately calls Kim's friends. No one has seen her. Tommy came into the precinct shortly after not being able to get in contact with his daughter. I think it was about a day and he had come into the 69th Precinct in Canarsie to make a missing persons report. Generally, the police wait 24 hours to investigate a missing person, but this time, they move fast. I don't know, something just said, you know, run with this one. I don't have a good feeling about this case. Detective Phil Tricola is on duty that day. I reported to the missing person squad, and I started to open up a case and, and investigate this myself. Pretty and vivacious. Kim is popular and has a wide circle of friends. An only child, her parents are divorced. Her father, a successful businessman, lives close by. Her mother, in Florida. Kimberly was a sweet girl, but naive. She had a little fire. She was a lot of fun. She was, she had a good way of us, and she had a generous heart. Detective Tricola suggests Tommy check Kim's parking spot for her car. And then he called me, and he says, I think you need to come here. I, I found something. Our car was not there, but there was an earring on the garage floor. Don't know if that earring was there, fell out of a car, if she was wearing it, but I realized one person would know if she was wearing it, and that'd be Liz Pace. Kim's friend, Liz Pace, confirms Kim was wearing both earrings the previous night. Now I know that the car was in that garage, Kim was out of the car, and that earring fell off. I knew she was a victim of a crime. There was no doubt in my mind. The detective's first thought is that Kim may have been carjacked. I immediately put an alarm out over the NYPD's internal computer system describing her uh, to be on the lookout. I got in contact with the Aviation Bureau, and I asked them to look at the spots where cars are normally dumped. Oh, we were out there nonstop. I guess the adrenaline kicks in. Sleep don't matter. I live on Long Island. Every night that I left Canarsie, I drive through uh, parts of East New York, which are known auto stripping parts. Uh, people steal cars, auto strip them, and dump them. Uh, cars are recovered all the time in certain desolate parts of Brooklyn. But Detective Tricola finds nothing. Later that day, when Kim's father arrives home, his answering machine is flashing. But there are no messages. Curiously, someone has phoned and hung up, twice. The police check morgues and hospitals. Nothing. They speak to Kim's friends and neighbors and to the couple staying at Kim's place, Joshua Torres and April Dadali. None of her friends had any information, had no idea where Kim Antonakis was. Two days pass with no sign of Kim. 
Her mother, Marlene, arrives from Florida. A family friend suggests that Marlene see psychic Ellie Crystal. A woman called me, quite hysterical, actually, and she asked for a reading. She had to have it that night. It was an emergency. This was Kim's mom, Marlene, who had called me. Host of her own local cable show, Crystal calls herself a medium. She says spirits come to her from the bridge outside her window. I realized after I lived here for a while that it's almost like harmonics. The two end posts are like uh, tuning forks, and the cables represent the harmonics. They, spirits seem to be very drawn and attracted to the bridge, and it's just kind of became like a dimensional doorway for me. Two days after Kim's disappearance, her mother, Marlene, arrives with one of her daughter's friends at Ellie Crystal's Brooklyn apartment. They showed me a picture. I started seeing images. I knew she was alive, and I knew they had to find her right away. Kim Antonakis has been missing for three days. Brooklyn police suspect foul play, but they have no real leads. Her mother asks a psychic for help. Ellie Crystal says her daughter is alive, but in grave danger. The psychic channels the young woman's spirit and tries to pinpoint her location. To go into her body is to feel very cold and very chilled. Her whole uh, energy was very weak and fading. I felt she was dehydrated. She has not eaten, and that if somebody didn't find her very soon, she would die. Ellie Crystal says she can see what the police already suspect, that Kimberly has been abducted. I feel that she made an attempt to escape, but they got her. So you could feel that, you know, she had been taken as a prisoner. You could feel the ropes, and there was definitely this feeling of being tied up. I also felt that whoever was involved in this abduction knew her very well. I knew they were men. I knew they were waiting for her. This is kids who are getting either back at her or looking to get some money from the family. It was one or the other. Marlene was crying. She started to cry right away. The whole thing was an extremely emotional reading. Before the session closes, the psychic has one more cryptic clue. The letter J was a letter that came to me at the time. I saw it as children would write uh, their letter J. It was connected to the person who, who had taken her. It came as a male and young, and Brooklyn. Marlene promises to pass on the paranormal clues to the police. But first, back at Kim's apartment, Friends and family have gathered to listen to the psychic's tape. I see her tied up. Tied up. Abducted. The letter J. Suddenly, Kim's roommate Josh Torres and his friend Julio Negron jump to their feet. They say that they're going out to search for Kim. Three that morning, a fire crew responds to a fire in an empty house on 86th Avenue in Woodhaven, Queens. The flames are easily checked. But in the basement, a grim discovery. A half-charred human body. The long hair suggests it's a woman. There was a remnants of a chair. Uh, the body was burnt beyond recognition. Queens homicide detective Louis Pia was assigned to the case. She had no shoes on. She was uh, partially bound with her hands behind her back and her feet were, were bound with duct tape. Arson investigators established the fire was set intentionally with gasoline. The coroner's report reveals the woman was burned alive. We started making calls. We had a body and we wanted to see if people uh, had reported anybody missing. So we called uh, the missing person squad. We were told that there was two individuals 
one of which uh, was a female in the 6'9 uh, precinct who was reported missing a few days earlier by her father. And that's when the phone rang. And it was the Queens. And they had said they had a female, deceased, victim of a, uh, of a homicide that fit the description of Kim Antonakis. A description that includes some unique body art. Kimberly Antonakis had some very distinctive tattoos uh, on her back, on her leg. The tattoos, an infinity sign, a scorpion. It's almost certainly Kim Antonakis. I got Tommy sitting at my desk and I, I walked out, I couldn't even look at Tom. I went into another office and I sat there. My week came to a screeching halt. And my worst fears came true. I just couldn't bring myself to go back out and talk to Tom. But I, I knew I had to, so I, I did. And he's like, what's going on? I said, you know, Tom, I said, there's some guys are gonna come in here and, and talk to you in a couple of minutes. That was it. My case ended. Case closed. So we took a ride over to the 6-9 precinct. It was very difficult to, to tell him that we, we had a body that was burned beyond recognition, and we're gonna need dental records to positively confirm that uh, the individual was his daughter. A missing person case is now a homicide investigation. A 21-year-old New York woman missing for three days has been found dead, burned alive. A psychic says the letter J is connected to her killer. When the brutal crime hits the headlines, even jaded New Yorkers are outraged. Your mind starts playing games. You get angry. You want to look for the people that did it. They tied her up in this cold basement, totally dark, and just left her there. Pete Donahue covers the story for the New York Daily News. This is, it was a very normal neighborhood. I mean, you, it's not a neighborhood that you would drive through and, and, and expect something like this to happen at all. Um, just, you know, nice, modest, you know, middle-class homes. And the neighbors were shocked that something like this could happen. Weeks go by. Though the police have several suspects on their radar, they don't have enough evidence for an arrest. The psychic was right about the abduction, about Kim being tied up and close to death. Could she help the police to find the killer? Tom Antonakis would call on a, on a daily basis, and he would say, listen, guys, you know, if nothing is going on and you have nothing at this point in time, would you go see a psychic? I shouldn't talk for anyone else, but my, my assumption was that it was all, you know, full of baloney. But I couldn't tell Tom. Tommy called and he said that Marlene was impressed with the information I had given her and could he come by with two police officers? And I said, absolutely, no problem. On the following Saturday, Tommy, his brother Joey, Detective Pia and his partner visit Ellie Crystal. Crystal balls, I don't believe in them. But Tommy, his motivation was to find out what happened and whatever it took whether it took uh, seances or a crystal ball, he would do it to my brother. One of the policemen, the one sitting closer to me, he asked a lot of questions. This is when Kim started coming to me. She told us that uh, there were four uh, individuals involved in the homicide. She said that, that she saw the letter J as being um, the first letter of uh, the names of the individuals involved. She kept seeing the letter J. The letter J resonates with the police. Joshua Torres, who is temporarily staying with Kim with his wife and baby, is a suspect. As are his friends Jose Negron and Julio Negron, who despite their names are not related. Another friend of Torres, Nicholas Labretti, goes by the street name Little J. Four suspects, four men whose names start with J, one of whom was living in Kim's apartment. What do you look for? Hmm? Justice? 
Vengeance. So many things go through your mind. This was front page news. It was shocking and, and puzzling, and, and it was very difficult for people to come to grips with what happened. People were petrified. They didn't know, you know, who was walking down their sidewalk in the middle of the night, you know. Despite the psychic's clues, it seems the police are no closer to closing the murder case. Weeks, then months pass. Then, on September 6, 1995, six months after Kim Antonakis disappeared, the police catch a major break. Friends of Joshua Torres, the guy who was temporarily staying at Kim's apartment, say he's been bragging about her murder. And I got a call from the detective, and uh, he basically said to me, listen, I got this, this girl and guy in here, and they're alleging that this guy, Joshua Torres, confessing that he burned Kimberly Antonakis, abducted her for a ransom, and, and so on, and gave all the particulars. From that point on, the investigation started to go full force. First, the police bring Joshua's friend Julio Negron in for questioning, and he eventually cracks. We, we interviewed him at great length, and he actually confessed, and he agreed to cooperate uh, with the district attorney's office. And then from there, we went and, um, and we grabbed Joshua and Nick Libretti simultaneously on the same day. Torres, the roommate, denies everything. But Nick Libretti, faced with Julio Negron's confession, also cracks. Between them, they reveal a kidnapping scheme that went very, very wrong. All they had to do was just ask. We wouldn't both would have gave anything to have her back. Involved were Joshua Torres, Nicholas Libretti, AKA Little J, Julio Negron, and Jose Negron. All J's, just as the psychic predicted. This was just animals that were fools and they were idiots. The trial of Joshua Torres, the ringleader, opens on November 1st, 1996. He pleads innocent. Josh Torres is a particularly twisted and grotesque personality. He's an evil individual. Gene Reebstein prosecutes the case. I believe Josh thought she was a good target for ransom demand because he could tell, one, that she had a lot of resources, and two, that her family cared for her. The way he looked at it there is there's money there and there's affection there. And those are two things Josh knows. Well, to get one, he knows how to use the other. Torres, who already had a criminal record, easily roped his friends into a scheme. The prosecution argues that at approximately 4 a.m. on March 1st, 1995, as Kim Antonakis parked her car in the garage across from her Brooklyn apartment, Nicholas and Jose grabbed her and drove her to a vacant home in Queens. There, they tied her up in the basement with no heat, no food, and no water, and left her for three days. Joshua Torres phoned Kim's father twice to play a pre-recorded ransom demand, but by accident, he played the ransom tape too early for it to be recorded. Later, when Joshua and Julio heard the recording of the psychic session, they panicked, thinking she was onto them. That same night, they drove over to Queens, planning to set Kim free. But after three days in the cold without food and water, she was comatose. The cruel bungling gang assumed she was dead. Joshua decided to burn the evidence. These guys, uh, Torres and Liberty, had absolutely no remorse. I mean, you got the sense that they just, they just looked like at other people like bugs. You know, they just, they had no feeling, they had no sense of value of life. The jury hears that just as Joshua Torres lit the fatal match, he whispered to Kim, life sucks. Despite the evidence, Joshua denies all the charges, but the jury thinks otherwise. And Tommy said, he didn't want the death penalty for these guys. He wanted them to suffer as long as possible. And he should rot in jail for the rest of his life, and he should never come out. Joshua Torres is convicted of arson, kidnapping, and first-degree murder. 
and sentenced to 58 years. As for Nicholas Labretti, or Little Jay, he's also sentenced to 58 years, but dies in prison of AIDS less than two years later. A year later, in November 1996, Julio Negron is sentenced to six years as an accessory because he did nothing to stop the crime. Jose Negron never gets to trial, as in June 1995, he was gunned down on a street in Queens. From the beginning, the psychic seemed to key in so clearly to Kim and her killers. One of the things from, from Ellie's reading that I was present at that was um, astonishing was that she was right on the money with, with the letter J. I mean, you had Joshua, you had Julio, you had Jose Negron, okay? And you also had an individual that uh, we were looking at in the investigation that was known as Little J. I think there are psychics out there that are good at what they do. I think they do have that extra sense. It's kind of like an enhanced gut feeling. The last time I saw Tommy, he told me that everything had been taken care of. There was a feeling with Tommy of completion that whatever this whole scenario was that involved his daughter's kidnapping and murder and the capturing of the criminals, it had come to a conclusion already. It was over. After that, I knew I wasn't going to see Tommy again. It was hard after. That was daddy's little girl, 100%. She had him wrapped. Can't put it any better than that. That was his, his, his heart. Tommy went to Kimberly's grave regularly. I mean, he went there on her birthday. He went there on holidays. He invited me to, to come after one of the verdicts. And he went and he said, you know, we did it, baby. We got that piece of garbage. In 2005, 10 years after his daughter's grisly death, Tommy dies of cancer. I think in the end, um... He felt he had nothing to live for. He died of a broken heart. This time on Psychic Investigators. In small town Maryland, a chicken farmer vanishes. We have searched the whole county. We couldn't find nothing. And we didn't know what was going on. It's a mystery, even to the police. Maybe she was not missing, but had become the victim of foul play. Until a rookie psychic takes the case. I said, it feels like something just hit me in the head. And uncovers a secret no one could imagine. Amid the farmland of Maryland's eastern shore lies the close-knit community of Berlin. In 1991, a sleepy place where family ties run deep, and so do their secrets. July 29th, and 55-year-old chicken farmer Mildred Louise Williams, known to friends and family as Miss Louise, says goodbye to her elderly mother and leaves for her cleaning job in nearby Ocean City. Miss Louise tells her mother she'll be back at noon. She's never seen again. Miss Louise's brother and sister-in-law, Robert and Nettie Moxley, will never forget that day. When she didn't come home, Granny called Dawn. Dawn said, oh, we'll check around. She's probably gone somewhere running around, Mom. Don't worry about it. Dawn is Miss Louise's 32-year-old daughter who lives nearby with her son and her husband, Billy. Dawn doesn't seem too worried, but Granny Moxley is. Miss Louise is never late. If she told you she was going to be there, she was there. At 7.30 that night, Dawn turns up at the farm with Miss Louise's red truck. She tells her grandmother she found it in the parking lot of the supermarket. Dawn says her mother is probably out drinking, and she doesn't want her driving under the influence. By midnight, 
there's still no word from the missing woman. Granny Moxley convinces her granddaughter to call the police. She said, Dawn, if you don't call the cops, I'm calling them. And so Dawn did call the police, but she told them that this is my crazy grandmother, my mother's run off with a man, and my grandmother's just hysterical. It's OK. The police aren't overly worried either. Miss Louise is a recent widow, fun-loving, and someone who likes to party. She played. We all do. She loved to drink once in a while. Everybody remembers parties yeah. with her. She was always joking around. But Miss Louise's siblings believe something is wrong. The day she went missing, a family vacation was planned. And Miss Louise never misses a party. I know it wasn't like my sister to take off, you know, like that, two or three days without calling. Two days after she vanished, the Moxley siblings, Dale, Robert, and Nettie, head to Berlin to see what they can find out about their sister. The first thing they notice is the truck that Don drove home from the grocery store. And the vehicle had just been washed, they say. It was so clean. It said to me, something was wrong here. In Miss Louise's house, another clue that something is not right. She had a safe in there with a lot of money in it. Safe was open and no money in it. News of an empty safe is enough to get the police over to the farm, but not enough to change their mind about Miss Louise. I was pretty much convinced at that point in time she may have been with someone and been off drinking so forth. Trooper Paul Frick worked the missing persons case. So at the point that we didn't have any reason to believe anything other than the lady was missing uh, due to her own reasons rather than foul play. But the police do issue a missing persons report across the state. Sergeant Bill Gordy worked the case from nearby Wicomico County. I was aware of the case. It had gotten quite a bit of notoriety. And we had had a, a small role in just tracking down uh, leads of potential sightings and that sort of thing. But every lead comes to nothing. The Moxleys take matters into their own hands. We called hospitals. We called nursing homes. We walked the woods. I think we have searched the whole county. But we couldn't find nothing. We didn't know what was going on. It seemed like I wanted to just turn everything upside down just to find her, but you couldn't. You just kept running into dead ends. Dawn and Billy even appear on television, tearfully asking viewers for any news of Miss Louise. Please come home or, or call. Yes, yeah. yeah, I do. A few days after Miss Louise disappears, her brother, Dale Moxley, stumbles on a magazine story about Deborah Heineker, a Maryland psychic. She has been praised for locating Vader, a search and rescue dog gone missing from the canine police unit in Montgomery County. Dale calls the family immediately. And I just said, maybe this is how we could, you know, get some help here. Deborah Heinecker, a former computer programmer, is new to the world of psychic investigation. I can focus on a subject or something that belongs to the victim. That's when I start to get the pictures, or sometimes I will hear sounds. I will allow myself to be the victim so that I can get a better picture of exactly what happened to them in their final moments. The psychic agrees to come to Berlin, but first, she asks the family to send her a photograph of Miss Louise, along with some of her personal items. I started to tune in, and the numbers 335 came to me. I saw a white horse it also came to me that Miss Louise was getting ready to go on some sort of vacation. I clearly saw a building, and I made the angle of the metal roof. Three days later, when the Moxleys pick up the psychic at the airport, they're not prepared for what she asks them. I read the numbers and I said, 
do these numbers mean anything to anyone? She said 335. My brother-in-law said that's Don's and Billy's address. When Mildred Miss Louise Williams disappears from her home in Berlin, Maryland, the police suspect she's gone on a bender. But a psychic sees a set of numbers, and that arouses suspicion. She said 335. That's Don's and Billy's address. Could Miss Louise's daughter and son-in-law have something to do with her disappearance? They had got in a fuss two weeks before because Louise had told him that she had changed her will. Dawn and Billy had recently stopped Miss Louise from seeing her grandchild. In retaliation, Miss Louise threatened to disinherit them. After my sister disappeared, Billy Warren would never look me in the eye. Deep in your heart, you have a funny feeling. With Dawn and Billy present, the Moxleys say nothing. But what about her other visions? The vacation. We plan a family reunion in North Carolina for a week. Every one of the Moxleys we're going to meet. We were all going to, you know, go on vacation. But the white horse and the metal roof are a mystery. The Moxley siblings drive the medium to Billy and Dawn's farm, the very address she saw in her vision. We went to Dawn and Billy's house, and there was this white horse in the fence right alongside the road near their house. It was spooky. Still unaware of the siblings' own suspicions, the psychic becomes uneasy as she nears the house. She takes Nettie Moxley aside. When I had her a bit to herself, I basically said, I'm afraid of Billy, so don't me leave me alone with him. And she agreed. I think she had no intention of leaving me alone with him. They enter the house and go into the kitchen. When Deborah got to the kitchen, she got a terrible headache. She felt a terrible pain. I said, it feels like something just hit me in the head. I think she creeped Billy out. She worried him a lot. I started feeling as if Billy and Dawn didn't want me in their house. They were being very fidgety and they were trying to hurry me out. So we go outside and there's this dirt path. And I said, I want to walk down this little dirt road. The same radar that knew that Vader was in the woods, it was that sort of radar. It just pulls me. And Billy did not want me to go down that road. He said, you don't want to go down there? That, that place is full of snakes. So that was enough to deter me from going back there. The psychic's intuition matches the siblings' growing suspicions. They believe Billy and Don are hiding something, but what? Deborah Heinecker returns to Catonsville, Maryland, but she's not finished with Miss Louise yet. Over the next few weeks, she continues to experience strange, extrasensory flashes. I was hearing the buzz saw. And I felt as if I had been pushed into almost quicksand. Like I was being pulled down and the mud was just coming into my mouth, coming into my face, just being covered with mud and that I was going to drown there. It was very frightening. A buzz saw, drowning in mud. Is Deborah Heinecker looking for a missing person or a dead body? Her psychic intuition tells her Miss Louise may have been murdered. She makes a difficult phone call to Nettie Moxley. I said, I don't want to start trouble in the family, but I said, I felt 
that perhaps Dawn's husband, Billy, had killed Miss Louise and buried her either in or next to the pond behind their house. Her response was that they believed that also, but they needed me to help them prove it. But proving it is easier said than done. Billy is an upright, church-going member of the community, not your typical murder suspect. Mr. Warren had a stable and positive life. He had a nice job, a, a, a home, a family. The Moxley siblings pass along the psychic's unnerving visions to the police but they fall upon deaf ears. They still believe the most likely scenario is that Miss Louise has run off with a drinking buddy. I've never believed in psychics. I've never believed in the supernatural. Uh, I've only ever believed the living are the people that can hurt you, not the dead. People that say they can tell you things that have happened or are going to happen, I just never had much faith in that. As the weeks pass, the psychic and the Moxleys increasingly think Miss Louise is dead, and Billy is the killer. But without a body or hard evidence, they can't persuade the police to ramp up the investigation. You can't arrest someone on a whim or what you think happened. You have to be able to prove what you're accusing someone of. If that's the case, uh, as I felt at the time, but couldn't prove anything more, uh, I couldn't in good conscience do anything different than what I was doing. I didn't have enough evidence. The police won't forge ahead on the word of a psychic, but Miss Louise's family can and does. She just made our search even stronger. She made our will stronger. It, it just gave us extra strength as a family to go search even harder. Three months after she vanished, the case is given new life. Sergeant Bill Gordy is transferred to the Berlin Police Department from nearby Wicomico County. My gut told me that there were elements of the investigation that needed to be refocused and that maybe she was not missing but had become the victim of foul play. In Berlin, Maryland, local chicken farmer Mildred Miss Louise Williams is missing. Her siblings and a psychic suspect her daughter and son-in-law. With a new detective on the case, their suspicions are suddenly taken seriously. We met with the Moxleys and uh, tried to work out something with them that would be uh, a cooperative type effort in the investigation. Miss Louise's sister, Nettie Moxley, calls Deborah Heinecker with the news. And detectives drop their earlier skepticism and begin consulting with the psychic regularly by phone. I view a psychic as much the same as an investigative aid as, say, a polygraph. It can many times put pressure on a person, and since we didn't have a lot of active leads to pursue, it was believed that this might well present one of those situations. There wasn't a day that went by that I didn't think of Billy and that case, and basically how I was going to get him. Not only do the psychic and the Moxleys have their sights set on the grieving daughter and son-in-law, now the police start watching Don and Billy more carefully. We did try to ratchet up the attention on him to let them know that we were more closely scrutinizing their current and past statements and behavior. Billy Warren has been acting strangely, nervous, edgy, short-tempered. He was just not a cool, calm, collected person. Finally, the police ask Billy and Don to take a polygraph. They agree, and on December 12, 1991, the tests are scheduled. Billy said, Dawn's not going to take the polygraph. And then after just a brief conversation, uh, himself elected not to. He developed a difficulty speaking. He was almost incoherent. He was obviously very frightened, very upset, very unnerved by the entire experience. It was obvious that there was more on his mind than just the refusal of a polygraph test. I think he knew the door was coming shut on him. The pieces were there. It was only a matter of time. For the police, refusing to take a polygraph is a red flag. But it's still not enough to make a move. We had a lot of conjecture. We had a lot of 
This doesn't add up, this doesn't look right, but physical evidence to time to a crime, zero. Maybe that physical evidence can be found where the psychic had been telling them all along. I told the police that I felt that she was in mucky soil and Billy and Dawn had that pond right back there and I had been drawn there originally, so I wanted them to go there. But finally, I asked the investigators uh, that were currently working on the case to go out to Mr. Warren's house. There, two of the investigators head towards the pond while Trooper Frick waits outside. Suddenly, the door opens and Billy calls out to him. Billy has something to say. He just literally fell to pieces in front of me and started confessing. Five months after she vanished, the terrible mystery of what happened to the chicken farmer is solved. Billy says on July 29th, Miss Louise came over to visit. He was alone. They argued over Dawn's inheritance. Miss Louise threatened to disinherit Dawn once again. He became enraged. There was a claw hammer there. He'd been doing some home repairs. He picked up the hammer and swung it, struck her in the head. He says she fell, and he tried to get her off the carpet pretty quick. He didn't want her to mess the carpet up. He buried Miss Louise in the mud next to the pond behind his house, washed her truck, and drove it to the grocery store parking lot. It was meant to be found as though she was there and left it like meeting someone. Later, when the psychic nearly stumbled on Miss Louise's burial spot, Billy panicked, dug his mother-in-law up, dismembered her with a buzzsaw, and reburied her under the floorboards of his woodshed, a woodshed with a slanted metal roof. Billy goes on to say that his wife had no knowledge of the crime. The murder weapon and the body are later recovered, as is evidence of blood spatter in the couple's home, corroborating the confession and the psychic's vision. Miss Louise evidently had been bludgeoned in their kitchen. And when they pulled up the rug, they found her blood under the rug exactly where I was standing when I said that I felt that I had been hit in the head. Billy Warren is sentenced to 20 years in prison for the murder of Mildred Louise Williams. Then, Billy drops a bombshell. He reveals his wife, Dawn, helped him to cover up the murder. She's charged as an accessory and sentenced to five years. In a cruel twist of fate, Dawn receives her mother's inheritance on her release. She knowed what happened from day one, mm -hmm. you know, from the first minute. You gotta realize you're being torn apart from love and hate. You love someone and they've done something to, to hurt one of your family members. Now you, there's hate over here pulling that apart. It's your mother. I mean, she gave you life. And you can cut her up and put her in the woods and walk out that door and go to church every Sunday morning looking over in those woods and knowing your mother's over there buried. The police credit Deborah Heineker with pushing Billy over the edge and into the arms of the law. I personally believe she played a pivotal role. Uh, I would like to think we could have done it without her. However, that's not the case. Her predictions were the key to causing him to confess. When he confessed, he said that he wasn't afraid of all the Moxleys. He wasn't afraid of the police. He was afraid of me because he knew I was going to get him. To put it bluntly, I think she's the reason the case was solved. So if someone asked me today what I think of psychics, I'd have to say that I have changed my views completely and I'd listen to a psychic. Deborah Heinecker also turned the Moxleys into believers. I thought she was super. As far as I'm concerned, she can walk on water now. It's like she turned the lights on to everything. We were all in the dark till she came along. I've never believed in psychics. I don't know much about them but I know that she was right on and she helped us. I actually felt that justice was going to be served for Miss Louise. I felt that Miss Louise deserved to have that confession. The Moxleys.
Moxleys have never gotten over it. She was a good friend. If you needed her, she was there. She should have had a peaceful death. I just miss her. This time on Psychic Investigators. When a local dentist is found brutally murdered in his home, everyone is shocked. And I said, well, what's so bad that I can't go in? And they said, you really don't want to see this. The police suspect his closest friends. Now, all of a sudden, we're under a light for everybody to watch our every move. Until a pair of psychic sisters share a disturbing vision. I felt a lot of blood pooling around my feet. And I had a flash of a bat. And all of a sudden, spirit guides just screamed out, law enforcement. Blairsville, Pennsylvania, an hour's drive from Pittsburgh, a factory town which once turned out the steel and glass that helped build America. This is small town USA, where life is comfortable and safe. At least that's what everyone thought, until a spring day in 2006. On the afternoon of April 13th, a teenaged boy makes a shocking discovery at his next door neighbor's house. He was so upset, and I'm like, what is wrong? What is wrong? I thought maybe Zachary got hurt or what have you. He's like, you have to come now, it's John. He's dead. Melissa Yu's neighbor is Dr. John Yelenick, a local dentist. She immediately calls 911. When I walk up to the door, I saw there was blood on the outside of the door and the window. And right inside the foyer, there was blood all over the foyer, all over the walls, all over the floor. In the living room, Lydic discovers a man's body lying in a pool of blood, his throat slashed from ear to ear. Immediately, I knew that it had to be a homicide. No one could have done that to themselves. Corporal Janelle Lydic has been with the Blairsville police for six years. But this is her first homicide. It just looked like there was a violent struggle and there's just blood that went everywhere. She immediately calls in the Pittsburgh FBI to help collect forensic evidence. Throughout the house, the killer has left a trail of blood. There were footprints going out through the living room, through the dining room, out the back door. The footprints may belong to the killer but he's wiped his fingerprints clean. Investigators notice there is no sign of forced entry. Nothing of value appears to be missing. Yelnik's four guns, stored upstairs, remain undisturbed. Corporal Lydic verifies that the crime scene hasn't been contaminated. Everybody who was on scene, I had them give me their shoes, and we made shoe prints of what they had on before they would even, I would even let them leave. And we compared them to the shoe prints that were found going through the dining room and kitchen, and none of them matched. The victim's hands are bagged to preserve any trace evidence under his fingernails. As the crime scene is photographed, the police conduct an exhaustive search of the victim's house and neighborhood in hopes of turning up more clues. We sealed off the area as far as you could see or hear and we I had officers walk up and down roads um, look in the areas of like the grassy areas the bushes everywhere to see if we could find any kind of murder weapon we searched the entire house and we just were unable to find any kind of, any type of murder weapon outside Blairsville is in a state of shock The word had already started to get out, and people were coming to find out what was going on. One of those people is the victim's cousin, Marianne Clark. 
And as I got to his house, I asked, you know, I wanted to go in. And they said, you can't go in. And I said, well, what's so bad that I can't go in? And they said, well, he's been murdered. And you really don't want to see this. Melissa Use, John's next door neighbor, has been his friend since the ninth grade. He was an awesome guy. He was a awesome father who loved his son very much. He was a good neighbor. And he also made a difference in our community. John was probably the kindest, most gentle, generous, fun-loving person you would ever meet. If you met John, you loved John. John Yelenik had recently moved back to the neighborhood after splitting with his wife of nine years. The divorce was a really bitter divorce. Um, every time they would get close to a settlement, Michelle always wanted something more. Including custody of their nine-year-old son. But after five long years, Michelle and John finally agreed to a settlement. John finally saw an end to this dark tunnel that he was going through. But John never got a chance to sign the papers. I don't think anyone in Blairsville had any idea that this could be anything other than random. There was no reason for John Yelnick to be murdered. Jennifer Mealy follows the sensational story for the local television news. That's when you saw the neighbors start to lock their doors at night, something they'd never done before, keeping their porch lights on and watching things a little more closely. Living right beside the, uh, John's house, my kids were terrified. We didn't sleep for, I, I bet, over a week. We were just so scared to be in our home. In the days following the chilling crime, the police canvassed the area. A neighbor reports hearing two men fighting about money in the pre-dawn hours. This casts a new light on evidence found at the scene, evidence pointing directly at the victim's next-door neighbors, the Uses, the family who first raised the alarm. We were on the uh, coffee table. We found a check that was made out from the Uses to Mr. Yelnick. They didn't want him to cash it yet. So Mr. Hughes was a suspect. He was, um, I guess, a person of interest is how we call it. Police take the victim's neighbors in for questioning and grill them about the uncashed check. I was going to open a bakery here in Blairsville, and John had given me um, $15,000 to help open my bakery. But Melissa says he asked for the money back suddenly, saying he needed it to make a tax payment. And I wrote him a check. I said, I only have 14000 at this time, and then I'll get you the, the other 1000 within the next couple weeks. The police aren't convinced by the story. Not only were we losing a dear friend of ours, but now we were actually being considered as somebody that could have done this horrible crime to him. With her husband now a prime suspect, Melissa is desperate to prove his innocence. A month after the murder, she visits two psychic sisters in search of answers. Hosts of a regular psychic tea party, Suzanne and Jean Vincent claim to be guided by the spirits of the dead. My psychic insights come to me in a variety of different ways. I start seeing flashes of light. I start seeing a scenery and images. I might uh, hear or taste something that would all be symbolic to what is this person um, all about or what is the situation all about. And I also have a spirit guide who uh, accompanies me during a uh, psychic session. I see a uh, picture of him that kind of emerges, kind of like a negative, and he gives me these uh, images and these visions uh, of the people that I'm trying to uh, communicate with on the other side. Melissa tells the psychic pair nothing about the murder. And the first thing my spirit guide said to me was there was a grief cloud all around this lady. I just said, oh my goodness, your boys found a, uh, a, a body? And she had said, yes, they did. The uh, energy around her was seen as someone might even suspect her husband of doing this gruesome crime of killing this neighbor. I was just simply amazed on what they, they could see that was going on with our family. 
The psychics have seen the murder of John Yelenik, but can they find his killer? Melissa just kind of casually said, well, who do you think uh, killed my neighbor? And all of a sudden, immediately, the spirit guides just screamed out, law enforcement. When 39-year-old dentist John Yelenik is murdered, his neighbors become suspects. Desperate, they turn to a pair of clairvoyant sisters who say the real killer works in law enforcement. I called uh, Suzanne and Jean and asked them if they'd be interested in coming to Blairsville to do a reading over in John's house. They agree. Three months after the killing, they visit the crime scene. As I was going to the backyard, I was feeling a very strong pull that the person who had done this to John had parked in the back. I had a vision of a maroonish, reddish SUV stalking John Yelnick's house. Hoping that the psychics can help to solve his murder, John's family has given the group permission to enter the house. No longer a restricted crime scene, inside little has changed since the murder. Blood, though faded, is still visible. I was immediately pulled to the dining room, and I looked right down, and I said, whatever happened, happened right here. The energy was very heavy and thick. I was seeing stab wounds. I had seen his neck, like, jagged, and then a straight line. Um, I also felt a lot of blood pooling and pooling around my feet. Then... Jean claims to see the killer. John's spirit had drawn me to a shoe print, and as I put my hand over it, I start seeing a person with red hair, someone with light eyes, fair complexion, freckles, and had a flash of a badge. And all of a sudden, these spirit guides just screamed out, law enforcement. John's saying, he killed me. Melissa is stunned. I knew in my heart who I thought had committed this crime and how much it resembled that person. And the details were just overwhelming. That person is Kevin Foley. He's been dating John Yelenik's ex-wife for two years. He has red hair and drives an SUV. And he's a state trooper. He was already the person of interest because he was the boyfriend of John Yonick's ex-wife. But the fact that he was a trooper made it difficult to believe that even somebody would do that. But it also made me think that he wouldn't have messed up and he wouldn't have left footprints. But once I got the psychic's information, you know, we wanted to look into it a little bit more. Police discover that there had been bad blood between John Yelenik and Kevin Foley. John Yelnick had frequent arguments with his ex-wife, Michelle. So John Yelnick and Kevin would have words, even to the point where the police were called. The trouble is, Foley is a fellow officer, and they have to tread carefully. And their hands are tied while they await results of the blood and the DNA evidence. That was taking the longest. It was like excruciating for the, not only the public, but for us. In the meantime, analysis of the bloody shoe print has eliminated one suspect. Tom Use wears a shoe a full three sizes larger than the killer's. It was a relief to know that Tom was cleared of being a suspect at that point. Her family name cleared, Melissa wants police to meet with the psychics. I was very skeptical of psychics, but I said I would go, I said I would you know, go down to the house and keep it in the back of my mind that maybe it would work, maybe it would help. Four months after the death of John Yelenik, the Vincent sisters meet the Blairsville police at the murdered dentist's home. They gave me information about a reddish-colored SUV. I was taken back. Kevin Foley drives a maroon-colored SUV-type vehicle. As we were walking through the kitchen, uh, John's spirit yelled out and said, pay close attention to the footprint. 
it appeared to me that it was an expensive running shoe. And also, I could tell the size. It was like a, maybe a size 10. There's no way they could have known that. There's no, I mean, even if they got a tape measure, there's no way they could have known it because it was faded by that. The psychics offer a prediction. The killer did leave evidence at the crime scene. Evidence they believe will be his downfall. John Yelnick has DNA of the killer underneath his fingernails. And we told the police, you need to pursue this. Would the long-awaited DNA results be the key to the case? Then, a final perplexing revelation. Over the footprint, I had a flash of dog tags. Whoever had these dog tags helped kill John Yelnick. This person has a military background. The psychics have given the police more to look into. But will their clues lead the police to the evidence they need to arrest one of their own? Four months have passed since the murder of dentist John Yelenik. The police suspect a state trooper is the killer. Their suspicions are confirmed by two psychic sisters who offer more clues. And the psychics actually gave us things to work on, you know, the dog tags, the military. Uh, the SUV, and the footprints. The psychics say their vision of dog tags means the killer has a connection to the military. I was sort of skeptical about that, thinking that, yeah, they got the car right, they got the possible trooper right, but he wasn't in the military. He didn't have dog tags. We looked into it further, and indeed, he did have a military background. The police ramp up their investigation into the state trooper and make a damning discovery. We found video evidence from local gas stations that Kevin Foley was driving through town. He didn't have to travel through Blairsville to get back home, and yet he did. Kevin Foley had means, he had motive, and now it's clear he had opportunity. But police still don't have enough hard evidence to make an arrest and Foley's not talking. He's hired a lawyer. We were unable to get to Trooper Kevin Foley. He was not cooperating with us, so we requested State Attorney General's office to step in and assist us in investigating the crime. A local police department, like the Blairsville Police Department, does not have the resources or the manpower to investigate a murder for months or years on end. So it became quite apparent that they were going to need help. The concern was, should they call in the state police to investigate this, considering one of their prime suspects was a state police trooper? And that's why both the state police and Blairsville Police agreed that an independent agency needed to be brought in to investigate this, hence the Attorney General. This was a very circumstantial case. Uh, this wasn't a case with a confession uh, or with an eyewitness. So it had to be built piece by piece. Deputy Attorney General Anthony Krasdick brings some much needed muscle to the case. One of the key pieces of evidence in this case certainly were the bloody shoe prints. This was a shoe print made from a Asics Gel Creed or Gel Creed Plus between a size 10 and a 12 and a half. Only 25,000 pairs were ever sold in America. Krasdick learns that Kevin Foley owns a pair. That company had a discount for officers. Kevin Foley was one of their best customers. Uh, he, he bought a lot of things from them, including the exact size and make that could have made those shoe impressions. While there's mounting circumstantial evidence pointing to Kevin Foley, there's still nothing to place him directly at the crime scene. And then... The DNA results came back and showed that there was a match to Kevin Foley. Kevin Foley's DNA had been trapped underneath his victim's fingernails, just as the psychics predicted. 17 months after the murder of the Blairsville dentist, the police finally arrest Trooper Kevin Foley. There was shock throughout the community. Half the community didn't want to believe, couldn't believe, that a state trooper could actually commit a murder. The other half had no doubt it was him. This was 
was a year and a half long investigation. Clearly, this wasn't going to be simple. This wasn't going to be an easy conviction. The preliminary hearing itself, where the police have to lay out all the evidence they have against a suspect, took hours. We weren't even sure it would get that far. We thought perhaps a judge might throw it out right there, but he didn't. At the trial, prosecutors argue that Kevin Foley had ample motive. The jurors found out that Dr. John Yelnick's divorce was just one day away from being finalized. If that happened, Foley's live-in girlfriend, Yelenik's estranged wife, would lose $2,500 a month in support. And Foley had another motive. He had it in his mind that John Yelnick was a bad man, a child molester. During Yelnick's bitter divorce, his estranged wife made accusations. She even took John to court. Although he was cleared of all charges, Foley never stopped believing John was a monster. Kevin Foley made no secret of his ill will towards John Yelnick. He just would tell anybody that John Yelnick um, was, a, was, was evil, should be killed, even asked one trooper to help him kill him. The prosecution paints the jury a vivid picture of the events of April 13th. At around 1 a.m., Foley arrived at the Yelnick's house and entered through the back door. You know what I'm here for? Get out of my house! You know what I'm here for? Get out of my house! Foley attacked Yelnick, slashing him in the face and chest. He pushed Yelnick's head through the front door window, nearly decapitating him in the process. The pathologist testifies it took up to nine minutes for John Yelenik to bleed to death. Throughout the eight-day trial, Foley maintains his innocence. But on March 18, 2009, he's convicted of first-degree murder in the death of John Yelenik. He's sentenced to life in prison with no chance for parole. He is appealing the verdict. He was the most wonderful person in the world. <laughs> he died the most horrible death. <laughs> and tonight, this is his night. We love you, John, and we miss you. <laughs> We're never forgetting. <laughs> For John's friend and neighbor, Foley's conviction means an end to a nightmare. And she credits the Vincent sisters for their part in solving the case. I believe that the psychics were helpful in this case. I felt like it was just incredible, the information that they knew. What we wanted to do from the very beginning was to make sure that we found out who did this to our friend and make sure that justice was served. Mm -hmm.